The Earth's surface is dominated by water. 70% of the planet is covered with it. This life-preserving resource is necessary for our survival, and yet we know little about what lies beneath its surface. From around the world, reports have emerged about sailors seeing something thought to be mere legend, huge and aggressive mammals with a taste for destruction. We still don't have much of an idea how old these animals are, how long they can live. It's, it's essentially equal to an underwater locomotive. The shape of the skull with this amphitheater of bone in the back is, is completely unique. I could start to hear the clang, the characteristic sound, the, the echolocation that they put out, and the clang would get louder and louder. Eyewitnesses report seeing rare white sperm whales. These monsters are said to measure up to 70 feet in length, weigh some 50 tons, and possess rows of 40 to 50 sharp teeth. As the largest tooth predators on the planet, they possess frightening strength and often have scars from their fierce sea battles. Fishermen the world over have feared this beast for centuries. It was the whale's mouth that had me trapped. Jose Silvino is a former whaler who lives on Pico Island, west of Portugal. Silvino knows firsthand what it's like when a predator this size turns aggressive. We have the whale harpoon and the whale starts to turn circles. The whale dove and then seemed to target the small boat, capsizing it. I flew off the boat and was hanging on the side of the boat. The whale comes again underneath the boat for the second time, and I feel now that I'm stuck between the side of the boat and something, but I don't know what it is. I was trapped, and I realized that it was the whale's mouth that had me. I was at the end, near the last two teeth of the jaw. The whale starts to dive, and I thought it was over. As the whale starts to go down, he opens his mouth and lets me go. Silvino managed to escape. The whale was crazy. It hit the boat with its tail. The tail whip was so violent that it broke the boat. There was another boat filled with his cousins close by. Silvino climbed aboard. Fearful the whale would attack again. We were about an hour and a half out at sea. They brought me to the hospital. Silvino spent a month in the hospital. He waited five more before returning to the sea. The whale used its tail to shatter Silvino's boat. But the beast's most powerful weapon is thought by some to be its massive head. While there have been numerous reports of these beasts aggressively ramming boats, some biologists think the aggression attributed to sperm whales is exaggerated. If you think about it, an animal that big, 60 feet, 60 tons, it doesn't really pay to get in a fight if you don't have to. Dr. Ted Cranford, a biology professor at San Diego State University, has been studying whales for two decades. He is skeptical that whales use their heads as weapons. If you were going to use a, something as a battering ram, don't you think you'd rather have something that had something pretty hard in it, like a big bony mound or something like that? Despite Cranford's skepticism, stories have persisted about a whale that may be more aggressive than others, a white or albino sperm whale. It was stories of just such a whale that were the basis for Herman Melville's 1851 literary classic, Moby Dick. Albinism is a genetic mutation that prevents the production of normal pigmentation in animals. These rare whales have only been spotted a handful of times. One of those instances was here in the Azores, off the coast of Pico Island, the site of a former whaling station. 
This amazing and rarely seen footage was captured by an underwater photographer. It was probably, I'm guessing, 24, 25 feet by that time. Um, still, obviously, a, you know, a, a young whale. This completely white sperm whale was photographed swimming near a large group or pod of mature whales. It could be dangerous if, if one sort of lost one's composure during the time that they were really close. It was, it was pretty unique in my experience of, of seeing a lot of unique things in the water. Now Monster Quest will travel to the Azores and the Eastern Atlantic. Their search will focus on finding out just how aggressive these albino whales might be. The area was an active whale hunting ground until 1987. It has a population of whales living close by. More importantly, this is the area where the completely white whale was recently spotted. The expedition team is made up of diver Dale Pearson, mammal expert Dr. Esteban Sarmiento, animal tracker Mark Peterson, and technology expert Jeremy Holden. Is there a reason why we came to this exact spot in these islands here? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, right here. There's a reason right here. This, this novel right here is about a white whale that attacks boats. We've had a sighting on these islands, in, in the waters surrounding these islands, of a white sperm whale. Here. So, it, here. Pearson believes he knows why the white whale might be aggressive. If you're a, a white animal, you know, the other sperm whales are grayish and darker color. They can, they can blend in more to the ocean. If you're a, a white whale and you're just standing out glowing, you're going to be more accessible to predation from the time you're born. So you're going to have to develop an attitude to defend yourself because you're going to be you're going to be being attacked more. Right. Something different, something easier and in the ocean when you're different and easier to spot, that means you're easier to kill. These massive beasts grow for the first 50 of their 80-year life cycle. As a result, they must feed constantly and the huge predators are always on the lookout for food. This thing's probably could have developed an attitude and now we've got a potential for another one out here. Sperm whales exist all over, but the, the fact is that a white sperm whale was sighted right off the coast here. So we're on the south of Picos Island at the moment, around about here. And the, the pod are usually sighted in this, this area south of Picos. The team must plan their search with the knowledge that sperm whales can dive to depths of almost 10,000 feet and stay submerged for over an hour. To actually close on the whales in a boat, deploy divers into the water, and be able to get to a point where you can actually film and perform these experiments is much more difficult than just spotting them with the, with the binoculars. What I'm going to be doing as, as we're out there is I'll also be looking for a break in the surface of the water. Anything that's not normal, that's not supposed to be there. So I could actually spot something myself as well. It's nothing, eh? The craft the team has secured is a Valiant PT-860. Small, fast, and highly maneuverable. It is ideal for this search. This is what I want you to see. The ship's captain shows Pearson something that can be even more dangerous than the whale they're hunting. This is the Portuguese man of war. And this is probably one of the most dangerous things out here. I mean, this is you, you have a bigger problem with this than you will any kind of shark. Potentially, this right here is a real problem. Because there's, how many of these are out here right now, would you say? Kind of millions. Millions. The team loads up the gear into their fast and lightweight rubber boat. They'll use the craft to search, and then deploy the divers as closely as possible to the whales. Got it? Beautiful sunny day, great conditions. No, no whales yet, but so far so good, good signs. The team searches the waters for food sources that are likely to attract the whales. Ah. But just moments into the dive, there's a dangerous problem. 
Start again. Uh, he caught a man of war to his face. Ah. Get some gloves on and peel this thing off my face? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. The team has brought a trained paramedic for exactly this type of situation. He pours vinegar on Dale's face to neutralize the toxins on his skin. You know, I see it on your face. It, no, it's extremely painful. It feels like seriously like someone's shoving a knife into the side of my face right now. Monster Quest is searching the waters of the Atlantic Ocean near Portugal for a rare, aggressive albino whale. The sperm whale is the largest toothed predator on the planet and has been hunted since the early days of ocean travel. Early seafaring man thought the whales were sea monsters, like the leviathan that swallowed Jonah whole. Then sailors in the 1500s found they could hunt the whale for food and use its skin for shelter and the bones to make tools. When the pilgrims arrived on Cape Cod in 1620, they learned whaling techniques from the Native Americans. As the colonies grew, so did the demand for whale products. By the 1800s, America was able to light the world with whale oil, an industry that would last until the discovery of petroleum. A single sperm whale was known to yield as much as 100 barrels of oil, but its size alone made it dangerous prey. The whales were known to ram ships, sending them to their final resting place. The most famous incident involving a whale sinking a ship occurred in 1820. The Essex sailed from Nantucket and pursued whales in the South Pacific. Steve Olson Smith is an English professor at Boise State University. He says this disaster was the inspiration for the epic tale of Moby Dick. One of the bull whales in the pod retaliated against the ship and rammed its its bow with its with its forehead, put a hole in it, and sent the ship going down. The theory at the time was that the hammering of the ship's carpenter repairing one of the smaller harpoon boats mimic the sound of an attacking whale. They uh, got into whale boats and, and watched their ship go down and the crew was left to endure the elements in open whale boats. Uh, they uh, did so for three months uh, experiencing thirst, uh, exposure, cannibalism, dementia, and ultimately death. Of the 20 crew members that were alive at the time of the attack, only eight survived the ordeal at sea. The Monster Quest science team is attempting to use computer animation to understand the biomechanics of whale aggression. They believe this may explain the animal's aggressive tendencies. Sperm whales are not as, as gentle as many scientists believe them to be. Dr. David Carrier is a professor of biology at the University of Utah. He has a theory about the evolution of the male sperm whale's massive head. It would have to function first as a battering ram to injure an opponent, but it would also have to absorb enough of the energy of the impact to protect the attacking whale. The head of the sperm whale. There are two sort of long sacks of oil. On top is a, a, a sack that contains the spermaceti oil itself. This, that's the oil that the whalers were interested in. It's the oil that is, that is just a really high quality oil for burning. Below the spermaceti sack is a, another sack which contains a waxier oil and that sack is partitioned with vertical sheets of connective tissue. And the vertical partitions in the sac that's known as the junk, the partitions of, of connected tissue, we think are involved in dissipating the energy that's associated with, with a collision between two whales. This method of dissipating energy has also been employed by humans. One analogy that we think may be relevant are the crash barrels that, you often, that are often placed uh, below overpasses on freeways, a series of, of uh, hundred gallon drums that are in a position to, if a car runs into them, the energy 
of that crash is going to be dissipated in the explosion of, of the contents out of the barrels. Carrier's hypothesis is modeled in the computer. With just some simple calculations, a simple mechanical model, using dampeners to uh, represent the shock absorption that would occur during impact, and it turns out it, it is. Dr. Ted Cranford of San Diego State University is skeptical of the theory. The sperm whale has the biggest nose in the world. And that nose is basically a bioacoustic sound generator. Cranford uses a 3D CAT scan of a sperm whale's head to illustrate. Since this is a gigantic bioacoustical machine, the geometric relationships between all the structures in there is very important in producing a beam of sound out in front of the animal. And it bounces the sound out through the series of lenses that are made out of more fatty material and into the environment. It is in their nose that the whale generates a distinctive clicking sound. This clicking is thought to be used by whales for echolocation or detecting positions of objects. If the whale would have damaged that sound mechanism, it would be lost at sea. I, I don't think it makes a very effective battering ram is what I was going to say. The expedition team is continuing its search for a rare white sperm whale that may be more aggressive than its gray counterparts. Otra, otra incidente que conoces de... Dr. Esteban Sarmiento has located an eyewitness who can attest to the fury of sperm whales. He just grabbed the boat and started chewing. Antonio Silveria is a former whaler. He still remembers an incident that shook this whaling community to its core. We are pulling the whale, and I guess the whale got caught uh, between the two boats. And instead of being face down, it was face up with its mouth up in the air. It just grabbed the boat and started chewing along the side of it, the whole length of the boat. I stayed in the boat and saw the whole thing. The whale chewed one of the men in the boat and cut off both of his legs. The man was taken to the local hospital, where he later died from his injuries. For more than a century, a whale watcher has sat in this tower on Pico Island, spotting whales off the coast and sending signals to the whalers at sea. Whale hunting officially ended here in 1987, but today they use the same methods to spot whales for sightseers. Dr. Sarmiento is on his way to the tower to work with a local spotter to find whales for the team on the water. He's able to see as far as 23 miles in a radius which gives him a pretty large visibility. Sidonio Goncalves has been spotting whales for 30 years. His father did it for 50 years before him. He's identifying a lot of, of the whales based on, on their spray. So, you know, the, the sperm whale has a characteristic one that goes frontwards while some of the bigger whales, it goes up to the top now sometimes you have to wait because they have some usually do it three times others do it two times but he you know he's done it so long for so much time now that he can just identify it at the first blow so the, the, the sperm whales are here year-round and in, in June and July they're closer to the coast they pretty much follow you know, I guess the deeper parts of the coast where, where they feed, and this is in June, July. But otherwise, they're, they're found and in higher numbers now than when they were being hunted. Supposedly, he just told me when they were being hunted, they, they would leave for a while after a couple of hunts.
The team is facing rough weather. You know, with the waves, uh, it's obviously harder to spot things. And then it's hard to keep the boat in position and get the divers in the water. Um, it's a little bit more difficult than I, than I had hoped for. You get some calmer seas and it'll be a lot easier to deal with. They have yet to see any whales. But it's actually hard keeping track of the, of the animals. Just as they surface, the boat's going to tip down. I lose the screen. I've got some shots, but I'm not going to review them now because I think if I look down at the screen, I'm probably going to be seasick. Holden is frustrated. Probably best that we go back. Disappointing not to see any whales, and it's, um, it's sad we've got to go back now, but that's just the way it is. Monster Quest is searching for signs of a massive white sperm whale in the eastern Atlantic near the Azor Islands. The science team is attempting to determine how much of Herman Melville's Moby Dick was based on reality. Professor Steve Olson Smith has found notes Melville made in one of his sources, a natural history book that said whales were not as monstrous as legend suggested. Melville freely appropriated factual information from Beale's natural history of the sperm whale, but he altered it to serve his own poetic and philosophical purposes in Moby Dick. Using modern technology, Olson Smith found new clues about Melville's writing in the margins of this natural history book. Very often when there is surviving graphite, pencil lead, within an annotation, infrared technology will pick that up, adjusting the contrast and the brightness. Uh, we can uh, recover uh, a good deal uh, of the words Melville wrote into the book. What was revealed was that Melville had used a natural history book for basic research on sperm whales, but it then greatly exaggerated aggressive characteristics of the creature. In one of the notations, the word monster is more or less discernible by the naked eye. While Melville may have used some creative license, one aspect of Moby Dick's ferocity was based in reality. The idea of an aggressive white whale. Probably the closest we can come to an idea for Moby Dick is a magazine story Melville read entitled Mocha Dick, the white whale of the Pacific. Melville's description of the whale was drawn from earlier tales of a great whale called Mocha Dick from the Mocha Islands of southern Chile. It was a killer and it was albino. Mocha Dick, the white whale is said to have a, a back serried with harpoons and trailing rope lines from unsuccessful efforts to, to capture him by whalemen. These rare white sperm whales may be more aggressive because they stand out in the ocean and are more susceptible to attacks by hunters. White animals in general would, would be rare because it's a mutation. It's something that's accidental and not deliberate. But it does happen. Aaron Thode is a whale researcher at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. Thode says it is a mystery why the mutation exists. So a lot of it's a complete mystery. Um, people have managed to track the same whales or identify the same whales across several years in certain locations. But even now, we still don't have much of an idea how old these animals are, how long they can live, what the migration is. The sperm whale can dive thousands of feet in seconds and stay submerged for over an hour. This makes tracking the beast very difficult. People try to estimate how many sperm whales are in the world, and the number is, all, you know, it's a step above guesswork, but the numbers I hear are under 300 to 400,000. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few hundred white sperm whales out there. Not only could the color of a sperm whale indicate aggression, the sounds it makes could also suggest an upcoming attack. Whales produce a series of short sounds called clicks and sound a little bit like someone tapping on a window pane. Click, 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 click. They're sounds that are a fraction of a second long. Faux demonstrates this behavior in this dramatic video. Filmed in 2006, it shows a whale moving towards a fish that Thode placed on the end of a lure as bait. As the whale goes in for the kill, its clicking intensifies. When they find something interesting, they'll tend to click faster. And as they're closing in on something to eat, 
they'll click so fast that they'll start to blur in your ear and form what people call creaks or buzzes. It is unclear if whales use the sounds as a kind of sonar device. No one's able to record an echo from a sperm whale click. No one's really actually proven, you know, directly that these sounds make a, an echo return off a of prey or off a of target. These strong, what I characterize as aggressive clicks, kind of a back off, move away type of click. It sounds like a little bit like a thunderbolt. Those that hear the sound never forget it. I could start to hear the clang, the characteristic sound. Tad Fister, a professor at the School of Natural Resources at the University of Arizona, was out on the ocean in a small boat with his video camera when he got more than he bargained for. About 500 meters away, there was some activity, it started to get going, so I got up and I started getting some my camera gear together. Fister stood up in his 22-foot boat and started to film. What he saw through the lens was a large whale headed directly at him. As it was approaching the boat and closing the distance, I could start to hear the clang, the characteristic sound, the, the echolocation that they put out. And the clang would get louder and louder, and, and the animal was, the individual was adjusting its course really honing in on the boat. And as it got closer, it would make fine adjustments. And then as it did its last dive before approaching the boat, it was a very shallow dive. And then it came up and it made contact with the skiff, lifting the skiff up, kind of knocking me into the bilge. The whale seemed to have no interest in the boat and swam away. And then about 500 meters again, fluked again and dove and took off. Personally, I took it as a leave me alone, go away. And so I did. <laughs> I left that individual alone and felt lucky, you know, because it really easily could have capsized the vessel. What did he say? Got it? The expedition team is on the hunt for this mysterious creature, while Dale Pearson recovers from his painful man-o-war sting. This is my new jelly, jelly protection armor system. So far, the team has spotted dolphins, fish, and turtles, but no sperm whales. They head south, away from the islands. The team moves into position as Dr. Sarmiento heads back to the whale tower. Then comes the signal they've been waiting for. Six, seven meters, more or less. Six, seven meters. He's got a group of sperm whales about six or seven miles away. Sarmiento radios down, and the team races towards the sighting. Try to pass in front of the whale, maybe 100 meters, something like that. Sometimes a bit more, a bit less, depends on what the animal lets us approach. The team gears up to get in the water. As the captain explains what will happen. The team gears up to get in the water. As the captain explains what will happen when they get into position. I will make a turn and I won't make the whole way. This way you have to swim. This is the animal, we are to this, and you have to swim this. I can't leave the boat there, otherwise it will change without any doubt. So you will have to swim 20, 30 meters, depends, and wait for it to go straight to you. Sometimes they change direction, sometimes they don't. That's, that's the game. But the whale is gone almost as soon as the divers break the surface. Not a friendly one. We've just seen our first sperm whale. A couple of hundred meters off the boat. It seems to be a uh, solitary male, but it's, it's dived down again now, so we're, we're going to just wait around for maybe 20 minutes for it to come back up. 
The waiting game begins. Sperm whales can dive up to 10,000 feet and stay underwater for nearly an hour and a half. Let's see if it appears again, if we can do something with it. The vigil drags on until suddenly they get what they hope for. Straight ahead. Straight ahead. We're on our way. Monster Quest is in the Atlantic Ocean, searching for aggressive albino whales. The science team has focused its investigation on the sources for Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Thomas Beale in Natural History of the Sperm Whale describes uh, the sperm whale swimming horizontally, but then sounding or descending to a deep depth. And Melville marked Beale's uh, description. And in the margin, he wrote that breaching may be the whale's act of defiance. It is here that Melville, who saw aggression in nearly everything sperm whales did, wrote the word monster. Pilot Sandy Lanham is a rare witness to the aggressive side of sperm whales, a behavior that even extends to others of its kind. Now, I thought maybe this was a game of chicken. Lanham is a pilot who spends hours flying over Baja, Mexico, working with sperm whale researchers. One day, while heading to Arizona and flying low over the Gulf of California, she saw something unusual. I was pretty high, wasn't doing a survey, I was returning home. And I saw, uh, at first, I thought I was looking at a blue whale, it was pretty far in front of me. And I used my binoculars and surprisingly found that they were not blue whales, um, they were sperm whales. I could tell that they were male sperm whales, so the shape of their head is different. And what they were doing is coming at one another Using her GPS to estimate their speed, she noticed they were going about 11 miles an hour, about the top speed a creature of this size can reach. Now, I thought maybe one animal would turn away, but it, it, it was not the case. They continued on a path directly towards one another. As the whales charged, Lana moved the plane down for a closer look. And when they reached one another, um, they ramped. I could see them actually hit um, head to head, and then their bodies overlapped a bit, um, and each of them appeared to open their jaw. So what I was thinking was that, as a toothed whale, um, that they were um, perhaps trying to lock jaws, or maybe they were trying to bite one another. They rolled a bit in the water together. Shortly there thereafter, they um, they disappeared. They went down. I imagine after they hit, I was only, they were only on surface, or slightly below the surface, for uh, a few seconds. I have never seen that particular thing um, before or since. Lanham suspects there was a good reason for the battle. I think it's significant that within um, a few miles of the ramming, um, there were a group of perhaps 60 female sperm whales with calves. Monster Quest is in the waters off the Azor Islands in pursuit of just such a whale. They want to see if it is a rare and possibly more aggressive albino sperm whale. We need to pass in front of it so we can leave the, the cameraman in front so we can, they can meet each other. Otherwise, there's no, no chance. Again, the whale dives before the team can get in position. Oh, God! 
whales are extremely intelligent. And it's almost like he waits for us to get right in position and then dies and just flips us the tail, you know? The expedition team can't seem to get close. But like the relentless Captain Ahab, they will stop at nothing to find this monster. So the, the whales that we're seeing today are, are probably individuals, uh, lone males, and they're just, they're just not hanging out. They're not letting us get close at all. The team meets to discuss the expedition to this point, and the man of war incident remains the biggest surprise of the trip. How'd you guys do? Did well, good. I found a jellyfish. <laughs> Look at. Uh, I can see. Yeah. What'd you come up with? I was talking to some locals and went to see the guy at the watchtower that, that looks for the whales. Yeah. And I got some pretty good stories, really, from the locals about getting chewed and people losing their legs. From, really? From whale attacks, yeah. The captain gives them discouraging news. Yeah. It looks like there's not many sightings today. Uh, it's a little bit choppy, it's not ideal conditions. That's what we have right now. The team decides to wait in the marina for a sighting. We got good looks at whales yesterday. We saw some, but the whales obviously have a high degree of intelligence because as soon as you come near it, they let you get close enough and then you feel like you're going to be able to film them and then they just, they go fluke up. The ocean's a terrible business partner. Monster Quest is searching the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Portugal for the real Moby Dick. This elusive creature is the subject of terrifying encounters that go back generations. This scholar has uncovered Herman Melville's lost notes, which show how he created his vision of the monstrous whale, Moby Dick. These fishermen were both nearly killed while trying to harpoon a whale. This man's boat was almost capsized by a sperm whale. And this woman witnessed two large bull sperm whales butting heads in a fierce battle over females. The team has targeted an area that has been known to have an elusive albino sperm whale. A new day brings a change in the weather and the team's outlook. The waves are real low and we have some sun. The sun allows the spotters to see the spouts, uh, the shoots coming out of the spouts. So it's going to allow us to have the best visibility and the best action that we've had. The team has found a pod of whales. Okay, camera's ready. Okay, let's go. The divers entered the water cautiously. You have this huge animal with a massive amount of weight going through the water. Uh, a, a diver is no match for that. Pearson emerges from the sea a few minutes later. <sighs> Got it. Got it. They were really close. Really, really close. Two of them right in the frame. I think that's about as close as I want to get right there, you know. The whales turn out to be pilot whales. While not as large as sperm whales, pilot whales have been known to attack humans. When the team examines photos taken by Jeremy Holden, they get a better look at the sperm whale. 
and realize just how close they came to the elusive creature. Steve Olson Smith's research shows that Herman Melville exaggerated many of the details of his book. Melville's books were at best a, a hybrid achievement of actual experience, factual information, and fiction. The author's creative license was meant to be artistic. Ultimately, Moby Dick is about the monstrosity of the world, the barbarity of creation. Melville appropriated passages from a natural history book describing sperm whales as ferocious creatures with a thirst for human blood, dismissing other accounts that did not support this view. Smith's research also turned up another startling fact. Melville discarded the original and very different ending to Moby Dick. In the published version of the book, the white whale sinks the Pequod and all hands go down with it with the exception of the narrator Ishmael who survives to tell the tale. But in this early rough sketch for a conclusion to the book, Melville seems to have visualized uh, whaling crews in whale boats towing the carcass of a slain whale away from the vortex created by their sinking ship, indicating that they were to lose their ship but get the whale. Melville changed his mind and allowed the whale to escape into the unknown. It was an ending he later saw come to life. In 1851, the ship Anne Alexander went down near the same spot where the Essex had sunk. Uh, this whale demolished two of its whale boats and then came back at the ship at high speed and rammed in its bow. And the sailors uh, had to evacuate. Uh, in the remaining whale boats uh, and watch their ship go down. And when Melville was told about this disaster by a friend of his, he responded, I wonder if my evil art has raised this monster. This monster quest expedition has uncovered some interesting evidence about the mystery of Moby Dick. The team documented witnesses who verify the sperm whale is aggressive when threatened. They also found evidence of an albino whale off the coast of Portugal. And the divers found the whale to be an intelligent and elusive animal to track, a fact Melville may have recognized when he changed the ending to his classic book. I'd say the idea that a sperm whale uses its head for a batting ram is an interesting idea and it obviously happens sometimes. But it seems like that's the kind of thing that happens under extreme conditions. There have been a few ships that have been sunk and some whalers have written about them. If you stick them with a harpoon, they're likely to do anything. They dive deeper than anything, any other mammal. They feed on giant squid. It's a, it's a, a byword for a monster, a byword for a quest. If you think about how much of the ocean you actually observe, it's been often said that we observe less of the ocean surface than we do of the moon. 